most importantly, the question that you have raised, whether it is going to help us uh, to, to resurrect the ghosts of the past. I would say that this is not an appropriate time to resurrect the ghosts of the past. We must bury the past and move forward because when it comes to cross-border terrorism, let's admit it takes two to tango. Uh, usually when we talk about cross-border terrorism, the discourse is one-sided, often blaming Pakistan for uh, offering sanctuaries to the Taliban militants. Before rebutting that, I would like to mention that Afghan Taliban, we should not make no mistake, they represent a significant proportion of Afghan population, especially those residing in the rural areas. And the Afghan population residing in rural areas by far outnumbers the Afghan population living in the urban areas. So any effort to outrightly reject them, ignore them from any peace process would be counterproductive. And that's what we have seen in the past. Pakistan's efforts to bring Afghan Taliban on the negotiations table is driven by the same very vision that Afghan Taliban represent a significant proportion of Afghan popular sentiment. Uh, when it's about uh, uh, the two-way street of these allegations, well, one has to look back in 1947 uh, from starting from Fakir of Ipi, the first insurrection against the state of Pakistan, how he moved to Afghanistan, how he was offered safe centuries by the Afghan government there. Moving ahead in 1970s, we have seen the terrorists of al zulfiqar the leftist uh, inclined terrorist organization, uh, they also operated from Afghanistan. We have seen 1970s again, how Baloch insurgents, they relocated to Afghanistan and operated from there for years before they were called back under a peace agreement. And then of course, after 9-11, uh, we have seen how terrorists operating in Pakistan have uh, sought safe sanctuaries in Afghanistan, especially Tariq e Taliban Pakistan and the Baloch militants as well. I would just like to recall uh, the assassination of Aslam Achu, who was one of the prominent commanders of, uh, of, of Baloch militants who was involved in masterminding a, uh, an attack on Chinese consulate in Karachi. He was uh, identified and then of course eliminated in Kandahar. And then recently the release of Malvi Fakir, a prominent TTP commander from Kabul prison. It raises a lot of question of course, but is this going to help us the name calling at this, this point in time? I would say certainly not. What we have to look at, we have to look at the factors that, that combine both countries, that unite the both countries. And I would uh, agree with uh, my, my, my co-panelists who just spoke before me, that there's a lot that binds us than what divides us. And Ambassador Najibullah rightly spoke about those civilizational linkages spanning thousands of years between Afghanistan and Pakistan. Uh, whether it's about religion, whether it's about cultural affinity, whether it's about language, cuisine, there's a lot that binds Afghanistan and Pakistan. And this is high time that we build on that legacy of thousands of years. And how we can do that, we can build on that civilizational linkages, firstly, by transforming our border from a barrier into a bridge. One reason that we have not been able to leverage upon civilizational linkages with Afghanistan is our tendency to treat our border with Afghanistan as a barrier, not as a bridge. That is why politically we lost Afghanistan to India and economically we lost Afghanistan to Iran. Only five years ago, Pakistan's trade volume with Afghanistan was around $5 billion has been reduced to approximately $1 billion and Iran has replaced Pakistan as Afghanistan's top most trading partner and India jumping to the third space. So for, for borders to act as a bridge, it is also very important to ensure that undesirable elements, especially uh, from terrorist organizations and transnational criminals, they are not allowed to use and misuse those bridges. One reason that it's been so easy for transnational criminals from both sides, for terrorists and militants from both sides, was the porous nature 
of Pakistan border and inability of both sides to manage that border. Now, during the last four years, to be precise, Pakistan has invested a great amount of resources to manage that border. And as both countries seek to improve uh, bilateral relations, this fencing of border would certainly come handy, but only if we increase the numbers of crossings between the two countries. And additionally, we have to build further on nascent Pakistan's goodwill that has been produced by providing 1,000 scholarships to Afghan students. There are thousands of Afghan students who are, of course, studying in Pakistan. And from this forum, I would like to suggest a knowledge corridor on Pak Afghan border to facilitate the movement of Afghan students to and from Pakistan. And we need not to look beyond the European Union, but in Asia, there have been a number of instances. I was in Singapore, and if you look at the border between Singapore and Malaysian city, Johor Bahru, thousands of students commute every day between Singapore and Malaysia to basically attend schools in, 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 in those countries. So certainly there have been templates globally that one can follow. And if there is a will, there is a way. And certainly on Pakistan's part, there's a strong will to build its relations with Afghanistan because recently, we have rediscovered our national poet's vision, which Ambassador Najibullah rightly mentioned, and which we had gladly forgotten in the past, that Afghanistan is the heart of Asia. If Afghanistan is secure and stable, Asia will be secure and stable. And if there is anarchy and chaos in Afghanistan, its fallout will be felt across Asia. And we will never be able to achieve this dream of Asian century. So this is Pakistan's domestic, economic, and security imperative to have cordial, strong, brotherly, and friendly relations with the country. And briefly, uh, another point that has been uh, uh, mentioned, uh, that's about Afghan Taliban and a client-patron relations between Afghan Taliban. Most of us, we tend to uh, ignore that during the last few years, uh, Afghan Taliban have diversified their sources of external patronage. They are not only dependent on Pakistan any longer for the sort of support that they got in 1990s or the first decade of 21st centuries. We have seen Afghan Taliban engaging with Iran. We have seen Afghan Taliban engaging with Qatar, China, Turkey, Russia. So going by the same logic, Pakistan has also sought to diversify its policy options in Afghanistan. During the last 15 years, or 10, uh, 10 to 15 years specifically, from Pakistan's People's Party uh, time in 2008, Pakistan has increasingly engaged with non-Pashtun, non-Taliban stakeholders of power in Afghanistan. It was, it was an ultimate outcome of Pakistan's conscious effort that President Ashraf Ghani chose Pakistan first before India for his first state visit after he became the president of Afghanistan. So Pakistan is diversifying its option. We are trying to improvise uh, as per the ground realities. But one important lesson that we all have to learn that we have to bury the past. We do not have to resurrect the ghost of the past. It is a lot that knights us and we need to focus all our energies on the factors that unite both Pakistan and Afghanistan. That's where I'll stop.